Good afternoon. I think we're going to get started. Thank you for joining us for our February Romano Clinical Rounds. Um, I'm Sue Di Giovanni. I'm the Vice Chair for Clinical Services, and I'm very pleased to um, introduce Dr. Santos, and she will then introduce uh, the other members of the panelists for the presentation today. But just before we get started, I just wanted to remind uh, people that um, if you have any questions about the presentation, if you could use the Q&A box for those of you who are joining uh, remotely. And the, for those in our audience, we're, we will have a mic available that we can uh, come around if you have any questions also at the end of the presentation. Um, in terms of the CMB that is provided, there will be a QR code on the screen towards the end that you can utilize, or again, for those um, who may not be able to uh, use the code, there will be an email that will be sent out in the next day or two, and you can receive CME uh, by completing the survey at that time. So to get started, I'm very pleased to present Dr. Elizabeth Santos. Um, I'm very pleased to, to say that I have known her for many years and so thrilled that she decided to remain here in our department after completing a geriatric psychiatry fellowship here. So it's been a while, the two of us. Um, she is currently the clinical chief of the, um, of the uh, geriatric psychiatry and memory care service. She is also an associate professor of psychiatry, medicine, and neurology. She gets around quite a bit. Um, she is also the medical director of our memory care program, and you'll be hearing more about some of the work that she'll be doing and the collaboration that this really involves to take care of a very complex patient population. Oh, thanks, Sue. Yep, it's been about 20 years since we've been working together. Um, and I'm super proud of uh, our geriatric division. Uh, so I'm going to start out with discussing the division, how we came to be, um, the parts of our services that many of you don't know about. And then we're using this case example um, to talk about uh, three specific parts of our clinical services. And uh, here with me, and I'll probably reintroduce them again before they speak, uh, are Ann Magnuson. She's a nurse practitioner who is new to the department as of June, I think, right? She just joined us, um, but her training is actually in geriatric medicine, and I've been working with her for uh, over 10 years uh, doing nursing home consultation. She was a primary um, you know, a provider in nursing homes, uh, and so she knows this stuff inside and out, and you'll, you'll see when we discuss our clinical services why it's very important, and that some of our providers are not, you know, uh, psychiatrists or even uh, mental health trained. And um, on her right is uh, Susan Rulin, who actually has been uh, part of neurology and psychiatry for almost 20 years, right, in some capacity. She was in, the, in uh, medicine, uh, here at Strong, and she has been working with the memory care program uh, in some capacity for almost 20 years. And uh, she's a wealth of knowledge, and she works with our memory care program. I do welcome questions. We will, um, I think, have a lot of time for the questions later. Uh, I will also say that this piece uh, isn't directly uh, mine. Dr. Brittany Mott was supposed to be here with us today. Hi, Brittany, if you're out there watching us. Um, she had a, a little emergency, so she's not here with us today. So I'm going to try to do justice to uh, explaining her work. Okay, so hopefully at the end of this, you're going to know uh, all about the geriatric division in psychiatry, understanding some of the very, very complex needs of our uh, older adults. And um, I'm sure there'll be questions about how to access our services after you find out what they are. Okay, there it is. <laughs> So when, when you uh, see the title, she's driving there, you'll understand once we discuss the case and what we found out and we all said, she's driving where? Um, so when we became a division uh, in 2018, uh, when Dr. After Dr. Lee started here, uh, we had to come up with um, what our mission and vision were 
And we started with thinking about with all the people who work in the different parts of our division, what are our values, right? So of course, we want to make sure that we're respectful to all older adults, but also their families, their caregivers, and you know, honor their aging process, right? Um, it is necessarily a multidisciplinary endeavor to take care of patients, families, people who are aging. Um, and everybody who works in, in geriatrics, no matter what their specialty is, you know, they're really dedicated people and we all have a common purpose for um, helping older adults age, you know, with dignity and grace, right? Uh, and so we have to be really committed to um, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary collaboration and trying to figure out this really key to the development of our services where to give care at the right place and the right time, right? Because there's a lot of services out there, but knowing when to access, how to access, it's very complicated. And when is, when is the timing right for an older adult who may or may not be a patient, you know, quote unquote, um, and their families, right? It is uh, an ongoing collaboration with everybody, including, you know, the, the patient. Um, so we came up with a vision statement, which of course, as a vision statement should be, is very broad, right? It's, it's our ultimate goal, that all older adults will receive the mental and cognitive health care that they need and deserve. And so our mission to do this um, really drives all the clinical care that I have created uh, within this area. Through clinical care and research workforce development, we will optimize cognitive health, mental health, and well-being for older adults. Also a very lofty goal, right? Um, and so this is our division as it stands right now. If any of you were here uh, in February, I think it was 2018 or 2019. I still don't remember it was February, I don't know why I know that. Um, we gave our grand rounds to explain how we were creating this new division. All right. And we have a lot of research going on. Uh, by some counts, it's definitely over 50% of the research dollars in our department are actually in our, our division in geriatrics. Um, so those are some examples of the research endeavors, the Hope Lab that we have, um, AD Care, uh, which we can take questions on as well. Uh, you've probably, hopefully, heard Dr. Thorstensen talk about this. Uh, he gives a dementia update. I think he did that within the last year. Um, all the dementia medications that we We've uh, heard about recently, hopefully, you know, in the news. I know there was a big uh, CNN thing about it, something in the New York Times, all within the last month. Uh, we have been studying all of those medications, those new treatments for Alzheimer's dementia here at the University of Rochester. We are the regional center for um, all of those drug trials. So we usually have at least 20 trials. I know at one point, uh, we had 28 clinical trials going on. Some of them are observational things, but many of them are medications. So uh, those will hopefully be some of the things that we're talking about in the future when we discuss our clinical services, how to treat Alzheimer's dementia or Alzheimer's disease, I should say, before it develops into dementia. So, um, of course, our educational endeavors are really important to this. All of the places that I'm going to discuss, uh, we have trainings. We have trainings um, from social work, from nursing, uh, nurse practitioners, med students. We have uh, residents and fellows in geriatric medicine, neurology, psychiatry, family medicine, um, palliative care. Uh, so they come from all over because they need to know about how to take care of their older adults as well. Right. But I'm going to focus today for the Romano Grand Rounds on uh, well, we're supposed to do that in this one. Yeah, <laughs> I pushed too hard. Uh, 
on the clinical services within our division. Okay, so we do have a very robust long-term care nursing facility uh, program. We do still do on-site consultations at a few nursing homes. Uh, right now, there are uh, Highlands at Brighton, uh, Monroe Community Hospital, and uh, Jewish Home. So we have on-site people from our division as part of uh, geriatric psychiatry. But we also serve 60 nursing homes around the state with our um, geriatric telepsychiatry program, right? And so, and, and many of them are not in this area. We have uh, places like on Long Island, we have places in the Northern Country, uh, a lot around Buffalo, in the Fingerlands, Central New York. Um, so these 60 nursing homes are spread out really throughout the state. And they're supported uh, with our uh, project ECHO as well. So hopefully some of you have heard me talk about that before, which is uh, a telementoring program. Uh, the one that I do every other Tuesday is actually with the state psychiatric centers and nursing facilities, right? And I can answer questions about that as well. Uh, and we serve even more skilled nursing facilities. There are over 90 uh, some point some hundred uh, skilled nursing facilities that join our project ECHO. So I'm right here out of the University of Rochester. And the idea of Project ECHO again, is to demonopolize knowledge because we have that very specialized geriatric psychiatry knowledge. We are the only geriatric psychiatry training program in upstate New York. Everything else is in New York City. So um, a lot of the programming that I have developed uh, with my colleagues over the years has been uh, not just for Rochester, it is regional. And when I say regional, I mean all across the state. Okay. There are people who live much closer to New York City um, that maybe they're like me and they don't want to drive into the city. Uh, and they'd rather drive three hours on the throughway <laughs> to get here and see us than to drive, you know, 30, 45 minutes into the city because then they get stuck there and it's still another hour, right? Um, and a lot of headache. And so we get people from all over the state who actually physically come here. Um, we serve at least um, with in-person ambulatory services over 35 counties, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, this is how precious a resource uh, the University of Rochester Geriatric Psychiatry Program is, is that th there aren't any other services uh, around and people will drive three to four hours to come and see us. Right? And not for Zoom. There's, there's one thing that I will thank COVID for, um, is that we have been using Zoom with our telepsychiatry service and project ECHO for um, since at least 2014. Steve Cassell can correct me if I'm wrong because I could not do any of this without you. Thank you, Steve, um, and our AV team. They um, really helped us to connect to people who don't have services. And it's really important to us that, um, you know, probably in your, all of your services, you have older adults. I'm, I'm sure you do, because there are not enough of us. There's less than 2,000 geriatric psychiatrists in the country, right? So chances are your older adult, you know, friend, neighbor, patient is not going to see one of us, right? So it's really important for me to teach you guys um, some of the basics of how to take care of your adults, but also how you can access our services when you need some help with consultation. Most people want to continue to take care of their patients, right? We don't need them to come over to us, okay? Um, but we want to, we absolutely want to help you take care of your patients wherever they are. Many um, patients have, have links with you. They've been working with you for 20 years. I see a lot of people from Strong Ties um, that say, I had, I had someone come in and say, I have been working with them for 30 years and I'm not going anywhere to see you. They wouldn't see me for a consult, but they see themselves as Strong Ties people. That's fine. So we're here to help you with all of that as well. Um, so for our telepsychiatry and child medical programs, we are actually helping um, skilled nursing facilities and the state psychiatric centers take care of their older adults as well. In fact, I'm doing um, the statewide OMH grand rounds next week to help with this as well. I did not know that when I agreed to do this. <laughs> but it's actually a week from now. Um, 
Okay, so that's one of our programs that more focuses on long-term care, right? We also have other programs that are specifically community-based, uh, and you will be hearing more about that when uh, I come back in April with Dr. Mott and Corey nichols um, uh, an attorney that works in our department um, specializing on interpersonal violence and victimization, where we will talk about um, our uh, elder abuse work and financial exploitation and what we're trying to do to address it and how you can access some of those services. So that's a lot of the stuff we do in the community. We, we have had um, for over 20 years now, the Share Alliance, which uh, is Dr. Kate Conwell's baby uh, with Dr. Deborah King. And they both have, uh, well, Gates is only partially retired but hopefully you know about this and this is a uh, community services we developed the pearls program which is problem solving therapy in the home i'm also actually medical director of that through lifespan um and so we still work very closely with them we work closely with the alzheimer's association uh, as well and i still do uh, elder fatality reviews um for monroe county uh, yeah monroe county but what we're going to talk about today specifically uh, is our ambulatory services, right? So these are the things that people traditionally often think of as uh, psychiatric services, right? Let's see. And most of you probably know that we have something called the older adult services, right? Some, sometimes people call it the older adults clinic, right? Uh, and this is what you would traditionally think of uh, there, as our uh, outpatient psychiatry, right? So this is people come in, there, we have therapists, we have um, NPs and docs who see patients for medication. Uh, we don't have a separate case management program or anything like that. We still um, work with, you know, uh, strong ties and the other like intensive case management uh, kind of services. But this is just your traditional um, ambulatory geriatric psychiatry service. So if somebody did a referral to psychiatry and the patient is over 65, no matter where it comes from, will automatically get triaged to us. All right. But there are service, there are uh, referrals that come to psychiatry where the patient is um, has what we would call like a, an older adult syndrome, a geriatric syndrome. They've had strokes, they've fallen, they may live in assisted living facilities, they have Parkinson's disease, you know, uh, something that causes them to maybe age medically more quickly, right? And we will accept on a case-by-case -case basis those patients as well, right? So if there is a patient that you have that maybe doesn't meet that criteria, they're not 65, but um, you think, oh, they've had a lot of strokes. I had a uh, unfortunate gentleman, uh, he was only 51. He had a series of strokes. I think the last count was seven strokes. Uh, and had vascular dementia, needed a lot of help, uh, had a psychiatric history. I actually personally take care of him. Uh, so um, we will absolutely listen uh, to, to you about that case. I am happy to do a consultation to see if it would fit with our services because our therapists are really trained to work with uh, people around the aging process, right? People who've had to uh, been forced to retire, right? That causes a lot of different problems with uh, couples <laughs> when they're suddenly <laughs> forced to deal with each other all day because they're both retired. There's certain different things that happen, right? That maybe you're not wanting to send this person to Chestnut, right, um, for that. So we will definitely, you know, uh, discuss those, those patients with you. Okay, um, and uh, we have uh, groups that are specific to older adults and how they need to learn and grow, right? So we don't do DBT per se, but we have DBT modules, right? Because transportation is huge with older adults, right? I mean, and if I'm telling you, you can't drive, but if you really just you can't drive for whatever reason, um, how are you getting to DBT? 
BT every week for a year for your at least once a week right for your individual and group therapy and learning all this or if you have some cognitive issues um, going through the manual and doing all that so we will do um, modules on uh, distress tolerance and mindfulness distress tolerance is a big one and we will have people we'll do 12 weeks and they can do them again right so you didn't fail because you didn't master everything with distress tolerance you know this week i don't know if i am um but we will allow you to come back you know it depends on you know who's in the group things are different right um so uh we're really open to that you don't have to be a patient at older adults let me also tell you that to access our groups okay um, if you have uh, an outpatient uh, a therapist somewhere else a private psychiatrist we are able to just enroll you for the group time, okay? Um, so don't let that limit you from, from having people uh, come to us. Now, COVID did you know, put, put the kibosh on it a little bit for our groups, but we're starting to, to do those again. There's narrative life review. We have an anxiety group, uh, behavioral activation. Hopefully we're getting our living with pain group up and going again. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, uh, things that are happening now that um, we can have groups in person. We did try to do some, you know, um, virtually. Uh, we tried to have some, some are on the phone, some with Zoom. We figured out you could do it virtually, but you can't do uh, if some people are in person and some people are on the phone and some people are on Zoom. They all have to be on Zoom or they all have to be in person. It didn't work so well. But we've had the anxiety group going actually throughout COVID in some fashion. Um, but I will tell you about an exciting program that Dr. Mott is uh, working on right now. It's called COATS. Um, she thinks it's a bad acronym, but I actually think it's cute. Um, connecting older adults to uh, technology services. All right. We're starting that as a program with uh, second year medical students uh, because our older adults are not connecting uh, quite as well as our younger adults and kids, right? I'm sure my 13 year old would be able to just get on Zoom and do all the things she needs to do for a group, but my 80 year olds are not having such a good time with that, right? And even getting on my chart. And of course, they all have different devices, right? Some have Samsung, some might have like an iPhone 5 from the granddaughter who doesn't need it anyway. It's, it, it's so many things. So we are starting hopefully by the end of this month, a program with one-on-one -on -one, uh, work with older adults. Um, they're gonna bring in their devices, whatever they are. We're gonna get them on my chart. We're gonna make sure their email's working. Uh, we're gonna figure it out and provide uh, pamphlets that are tailor-made for them with screenshots of what they need to do <laughs> to get back connected with people. So we can have them access um, services even in the winter when they can't get here, right? Um, so uh, for now, we're gonna be limiting that to our patients in older adults and in the memory care program, but uh, we'll let you know how it goes, but we're very excited to start that. I'm, I'm thinking the launch date was February 27th. All right, so that's older adult services. That's the services that you know most people in psychiatry would know what, what it looks like. But what about the memory care program? Okay, so that is a program that has been around the university um, in some form for over 20 years, actually. It's been in different locations. It did not come over uh, under psychiatry, though, until oh, a couple years after I took over. 2016. It might have been 2018 when it fully came over um, to psychiatry, but it is an Article 28 medical clinic, just like MIPS is. Okay, it is not psychiatry. It is not um, under OMH regulation. There are no, it's not Article 31. And hallelujah, we have no treatment plans that we have to do. Okay, um, that was a really big thing for me. So, but we are with geriatric psychiatrists neurologists and geriatricians okay so multidisciplinary in every way and with social work but our social workers are not therapists they are not omh mental health therapists nor are they care managers per se but they help in different ways and i think once you hear susan talk about all of the work she's done for this case you are going to see um, how special our social workers are but they can't right now they don't bill 
right? And so a lot of the work that we do with memory care, the billing is all just like your regular office visit uh, and consultation. And then um, we do a lot with grants. So we have a lot of grant money that helps fund our, our services uh, and helps with the good work that um, Susan and her colleagues, uh, Megan Ailes and Margaret Hance do uh, at memory care. So again, this is an article 28 medical model clinic. And when we see patients for memory care evaluations, we may be just doing a consultation, but our ongoing care is with follow-up like at six months, eight months, a year for mild cognitive impairment. So if you're expecting that somebody's gonna come to the clinic and they're gonna see somebody every month, and that doesn't happen. Nobody wants to be tested every month, right? And the things don't change that much. I mean, you've tried to do, you know, a mocha every month with somebody who's agitated and, you know, from dementia, they don't, they're not going to do it, right? So we're just trying to engage them. A lot of the work we do is outside of the clinic, right? And you'll, you'll hear about that. Um, but it is still in the clinic. It is a medical model. You need to come in. You know, we do their vital signs. We do all that. And so for many years, um, we have been looking uh, for another way that we could increase access to these services, these specialty services, um, and help people when they need it, right? Because the wait list can be long, right? It has been six to eight months. We've cut it down now. I think we're more at like two to three months right now. But partly, uh, it's because of the Alzheimer's and Dementia Care Program. That's uh, our acronym is ADC. And you can look up adcprogram.org, right? It is a national model. We were chosen um, to be the dissemination site for this uh, many years ago, prior to COVID. And it's a program that was developed with the John Hartford Foundation. Uh, and there's lots of articles about how great this is. There are more coming out. Um, but unfortunately, uh, a number of things happened. Dr. Yates Conwell, actually, and Dr. Carol Podgorski, our new associate chair, right, um, for education. Oh, no, she's not the associate. That's uh, Sapora. Sorry, Sapora. Um, but I forgot what her title is. But Carol has been the <clears throat> clinic director of the memory care program for, for many years before I was. And she and Dr. Conwell actually found this program. Uh, and we are implementing this now, and we're gonna talk about this. Um, th we are doing home visits to patients uh, with concerns about dementia, whether or not they already had um, the dementia diagnosis. So we are gonna talk now about, and by the way, all of this is now co-located at 315 Science Parkway as of April of 2022. I'm hoping we're gonna have a, an open house for all of you, um, you know, maybe in June, something like that when it's nicer outside and then, you know, uh, and it's not so great. So you can see where all of this magic happens. So we're going to use this case right now um, to demonstrate how these services uh, work together, right? Uh, this is the case of BA, and she's a 74-year-old uh, Black woman who was seen at older adult services, so in, in the regular psychiatry ambulatory service, right? And she was actually in treatment with us in 2018 to 2019 for depression, and she got stabilized, and so went back to her primary care physician. Everything was, was looking good. She was on Lexapro, uh, I think, at the time, and everything was fine. But she has a very complicated medical history. I only wrote there um, those things. There are many other things actually I could have written, but I chose a few um, really important ones. She's been on dialysis since 2016, right? Um, so that's three times a week she goes. Uh, she has hypertension, diabetes. She's definitely overweight. Um, she has a pacemaker. She's had CHF. I think she even has pulmonary hypertension. She had lumbar surgery uh, in the 90s, 92. She's had a lot of falls. This is important because and she ha even had a subdural hematoma in 2021. So she was doing great, you know, with her chronic medical conditions. Uh, her, her depression seemed to be stable, and then it didn't, right? So she had some falls, had the subdural hematoma, um, and around this time, 
her primary care physician, and actually March before the, um, oh no, that was a, almost a year after the subdural hematoma, uh, referred her back to older adults because she had done so well, she needed help with depression, right? Uh, and she was on escitalopram 10 milligrams. So she eventually did come in. I think it was a little bit uh, hard to schedule. She has uh, dialysis three times a week, right? But she did start seeing one of our therapists, Laura, um, regularly, very pleasant, did show up for her appointments, um, and got to see Dr. Mott finally in August of 2022, so last year. And she endorsed depression, poor appetite, um, some anxiety that comes and goes, but also feeling very isolated. So Dr. Mott and Laura were exploring this with her. Turns out, you know, she lives with two great granddaughters, right? Um, but they're great granddaughters. They were, uh, one of them is a teenager. She didn't feel connected to people. They were in and out. They just lived with her, right? They were, they were like tenants to her. Um, and Dr. Mott was very, very concerned that nobody was helping her, you know, with this woman who was going to dialysis three times a week. She was describing um, that she does all her own grocery shopping. She cooks all the meals. Um, you know, she takes out the garbage. You know, and again, this is a woman who's falling all over the place. She's doing the laundry. She's doing all the household chores. You know, and she seemed to be kind of complaining about this. Like, they, I've got my great granddaughters, but they don't do anything. I think there may have been some expletives involved with that discussion, but I will not use those. Um, but there was a lot of tension, right, in this house. Um, so she has a daughter that lives out of state. That's all we knew, right? Um, but she also knew that she's having some trouble with her memory, right? Um, she didn't think she needed a lot of help because she's very independent. She could do all this stuff uh, on her own. But Dr. Mott started noticing like, what's going on? So this is the first time Dr. Mott's meeting her, right? And she got a lot of information. She kept her on the, the Lexapro and had her come back in September. So when she sees her in September, actually, she actually seemed improved. She didn't change any medication, um, but she thought, okay, let's look at the cognitive impairment. So she did a MOCA, Montreal Cognitive Assessment, and she only scored 12, which was kind of surprising given that she says she's doing all this stuff. She's cooking her meals, she's driving to dialysis, she's doing all this stuff on her own. Um, but is she really? I don't know, right? Because a MOCA of 12, you would think someone is super impaired, right? And so the normal is 30, right? Or above 26. Um, but clearly there's some problems. So she thought, well, she probably meets criteria for dementia because she's having some issues um, with ADLs. And she discussed the case with me. And I said, well, we can see her at memory care because her mood's improving, you know, let's see what we can do. Um, but for memory care, if any of you have sent referrals, we usually need someone to be psych stable, right, for at least six months, right? It's not fair um, if somebody is in the midst of a deep depression, right, or some severe anxiety, having active panic attacks, that we test them, right, and, uh, for, for memory impairment. Uh, we have sent more than one person to neuropsych testing. They do the three, four hour long testing. And then after doing all that, it comes back, well, she needs treatment for her depression or anxiety, right? Uh, you know, we, we don't think it's fair to, to, for people to go through all of that just for us to say, well, you still need treatment for your depression. So we do um, not usually see anyone until they're psych stable in memory care. But there were these questions about, well, how is she doing at home? And right at the time when we were starting the uh, ADC program, the Alzheimer's and Dementia Care Program, so this program uh, is designed for uh, a nurse practitioner and a social worker, uh, usually a BSW, to go out, uh, they're called the dementia care specialist and the dementia care assistant, to go out into the home and do a visit there, see what's what, do the first evaluations there. We have so many referrals, we get um, 30 to 50 referrals actually a week to memory care 
um, that we decided to take some of those referrals and put them in our um, ADC program, right? Uh, triaging them based on some urgency, right? So if we think somebody is having some you know, active hallucinations, there's some safety concerns in the moment, at least we could go out there and see what's what, right? Because you could really see a lot more when you do the home visit, which Anna is gonna talk about, right? So, all right. So Anne is going to talk about our visit, and because this is one of this was actually our first visit, um, it was a lot of people who went into the home. By the way, this is again normally supposed to be a nurse practitioner and a social worker, and which is, is the case now, right? But um, at this time, we actually had Barb Dahlberg um, is our other nurse practitioner. Um, sorry to child that she came to us, but thank you. Um, so she is the other nurse practitioner and myself. We all went out plus um, Susan to go see her and Anne's gonna tell you what we found. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as Dr. Santos was saying, um, we saw this patient with the ADC team um, for, for the home visit. And one of her daughters who lives locally was there for the visit. Um, one of the great aspects about doing a home visit is getting to see the patient in their home environment. You really get a good idea of how they're living their day to day life. Um, on the home visits, we're always assessing for safety concerns. We look at their pill boxes and medication bottles to see if it appears that they're taking their medications correctly. We sometimes look in the refrigerators to see if there is any expired food and to see if it's well stocked. We also assess for foul odors in the house and we you know, look around a little bit to see how clean the house looks. Um, one thing we noticed right away in this patient's home was how neat and clean it was. We also noticed that there were multiple throw rugs throughout um, different thicknesses of the throw rugs, which we recognized as a tripping hazard. Um, she had her pill box on the kitchen table, and by looking at the box, it appeared that she had taken her pills that morning and the days prior. She had handwritten notes taped on the kitchen countertop to help her remember important things. She showed us a large stack of mail, which included bills, and she said that she was behind in her rent payments because a while back she forgot to pay the rent. She shared that her daughter, who lived out of state, was visiting regularly. And during these visits, her daughter would review the stack of mail and her daughter was now also helping with her finances. She shared that she was losing weight because she wasn't hungry. She appeared depressed and was tearful at times during the visit. She felt that the escitalopram was helping with her mood. She also felt that the psychotherapy as well as the visits with her psychiatrist, Dr. Mott, were helping. And she stated that Dr. Mott gave her hope. When asked if her family assists her with the household chores, she stated that she doesn't routinely ask for help because her family helps like they, because her family acts like they don't want to help her, and she believes that her family does not have time for her. But she also said that she doesn't like it when the family does the household chores the wrong way, so that she has to fix what they did. Her daughter who was there for the visit said that she was resistant to accepting help and specified that if the family helps her with the chores, the patient will follow right behind them and redo what was already done. We found out from her daughter that the Home Safe Home program came out to the house and removed the throw rugs. But after they left, she put the throw rugs back down. She struggled to stand from a seated position and walked throughout her house without her walker and by holding on to nearby furniture. She stated that the furniture was strategically placed so that she could, she could get around by leaning onto the furniture and not use her walker. She also said that the furniture was placed so that if she falls, she will fall into the furniture instead of onto the floor. She said that her balance was off and she was having frequent falls. She had a personal emergency response button, which she wore around her neck. The most alarming thing that she shared was that she was driving to and from dialysis three times a week. And when she feels dizzy after dialysis, she will sit in the car until the dizziness improves and then drive home. There were also several recent instances when she had gotten lost while driving. And one time she got lost while driving home from dialysis. 
On these visits, we typically do uh, cognitive testing. However, at this particular visit, I didn't as Dr. Mott had just done a MOCA on her just a few weeks before. And as Dr. S uh, Santos mentioned, her MOCA score was low at a 12. She was independent with all her ADLs. However, she needed assistance with some I ADLs, such as her finances. And we felt that it was not safe for her to drive anymore. We um, uh, felt that she did have a major neurocognitive disorder, uh, likely due to multiple etiologies. So for recommendations, we recommended um, that she should not drive anymore. And we have informed her, her daughter of this. And we suggested that a Medicab be used to go to dialysis appointments and family could help with other transportation needs. We recommended an adult day program, which she could attend on non-dialysis days and give her some more socialization, which she really seemed to enjoy. In terms of her depression, she appeared resistant to further medication changes, but we um, suggested that mirtazapine could be considered in the future as this could help with her appetite and weight loss and also her mood. She was on Eliquis for atrial fibrillation, so I alerted her cardiologist that she was falling a lot. Lastly, she was on hydroxyzine, uh, so I recommended that her PCP review the ongoing need for this and possibly consider an alternative medication due to its anticholinergic properties and the risk that it could contribute to confusion and falls. We did not recommend starting a cholinesterase inhibitor or memantine for her memory as we felt that her risk factors were too great, taking into account her complex medical history, in particular, her complicated cardiac history. And, and I will say, so Ann and I had talked to her together and remember the table? Mm -hmm. I mean, the table was like up here. It was one of the, it wasn't just like a normal, um, you know, kitchen, low kitchen table. We had to get up on stools. So that we're all like climbing up on the stool and she kept trying to get down, you know, like she, she dropped something. We, we watched her do all these things like grab onto the front. We watched her scold people <laughs> like, because she doesn't think they clean up the kitchen while we were, we were right there. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was fine, kind of uh, disconcerting on many levels. Mm -hmm. We just kept looking at each other. Oh my God, we we're, were, were like lunging every time she would fall. <laughs> and the rugs, I mean, that the picture I had of the rugs were the only one I could find, but I mean, they were layered upon layered and so, and they were different kind of rungs. And, and like, we were tripping on them, you know, like just walking. So we were like, how is she walking with her walk? Well, she's not using her walker. She's using these chairs and like all the things, but she, they, were, and they were strategically placed. And I don't think she would push that button necessarily if she fell until she really, maybe she was there for hours. Cause she, mm -hmm. she's so independent. She would not want to ask for any help. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no way. Yep, she had already, she had also moved a large dining room table. She had the dining room table on the carpet and she moved it back into the other room. So that was. Oh yeah, that table that we were, it was a heavy wooden table. It was, it was sturdy, but she it was moved like it herself. High. And, and um, I, I actually didn't mention, cause it wasn't in Brittany's write up, but um, Mobile Crisis saw this patient as well, by the way. Um, so this is a touch as everybody. Um, they were called by the family when there was some dispute. I think part of it is an ongoing dispute that no one's helping her and, and such. And, and she had <clears throat> fallen from the table and she moved it, right? She was so mad that day or something, she had moved the table, they told us, um, by herself over all of these rugs. They keep trying to move their rugs and she keeps putting them back. So the family did try some things, but Susan's gonna tell you what we found out because we, she found out a lot of information that you would never have known unless we did this home visit and further investigation. So usually at the, at the home visit, I'm meeting with the caregiver. Well, the nurse practitioner, Ann or Barb, are meeting with the patient. We start out together and then we kind of divide up and I mo mostly meet with the caregiver. After the home visit, I think the first thing that I really needed to work on was her transportation, getting that transportation set up I know dialysis usually sets up transportation, so they were going to be a key, a key um, person in setting that up. Um, she had been very resistant to using transportation services in the past, but when I called her to discuss Medicaid transportation, she admitted to me that she was afraid to drive in the snow, and she said sometimes when she drives, she cries. Um, so dialysis set up a tr the transportation and she was using the transportation and we were all happy that she wasn't driving to dialysis. A few days after it started, the dialysis social worker called me and said, uh, Medicaid has been 
um, was no longer active. So that was a, another problem there. So she started driving to dialysis again while we worked on that. Um, the dialysis social worker was a really key person. Um, she had known the patient for many years and she spent three days a week, four hours with her at, that, at the, each visit. Um, she also said that she was one of the favorite patients that they had in, at dialysis. But she did share the following information with me. She said the elder abuse prevention program at Lifespan had been involved in the past regarding some issues with the oldest granddaughter who was no longer living in the home. Um, they also discovered that the local daughter, the one we met with at the home visit, had been cleaning out her bank accounts and stole all her COVID stimulus checks. Um, she told me that the patient has to keep really busy all the time. She even has a hard time sitting at dialysis. Um, she rakes her own leaves. She shovels her own driveway. She tends her flowers. She has beautiful flowers in her front yard, and she's known all over the neighborhood for her beautiful flower gardens. Um, so I decided I needed to contact the daughter in Virginia, um, her daughter out of state, to schedule a meeting next time she visits. She said to me, my role is to bring things back on track. She shared that the patient had raised her three great granddaughters since birth. She actually took all three of them home from the hospital. She said that her mom, sister, the patient, um, and the local daughter, and the three great granddaughters were impenetrable. She told me that her mom and sister had a codependent relationship that no one could get in, no one could break them apart. So since the local daughter was not so much in the patient's life right now, her daughter in Virginia felt that she was becoming more depressed and mourning her, her quote was, mourning her as if she had died. So we discussed some of the main concerns um, of the patient's medical and service providers, driving, definitely one of them, um, whether she's taking her medications correctly, all the falls that she was having in the home, and going up and down the basement stairs to do her laundry. She had some steep basement stairs, and she was taking her laundry down those steps and bringing it back up. And the dialysis social worker had shared with me that she did have some, some falls a few times down the last, last bottom stairs and banged up her shoulders and different parts of her body. Um, so they, the daughter told me also um, that on the last home visit, they completed a new health care proxy and a power of attorney. So the daughter in Virginia was actually her new health care proxy and power of attorney. Um, she was taking over her bills and she was planning to visit her mom the next week. So we arranged to meet. Um, the day that we were supposed to meet, I just called to see if everybody was at the house and Patient was tearful and said her daughter wasn't able to visit that weekend, and she was really disappointed by it. Um, I followed up, one thing nice about, she sees people in the older adult clinic more than in our, um, the ADC program, so I could see when she had scheduled appointments and I could meet with her in the waiting room. We shared the same waiting room. So I followed up with her after one of the appointments in the adult, older adult clinic to re, um, sign the release of information for Department of Human Services in order to assist with reestablishing her Medicaid. Um, with the increased Medicaid income limits, as of January 1st, her income fell below the 1563 monthly income limit. So she would be eligible for Medicaid, again, without a spend down, which she had previously had. So I completed the request for Medicaid review, review budget form and submitted it to the Department of Human Services. And they actually turned her Medicaid on really quickly. I called dialysis, they started the transportation again. Um, as far as her housing, she had two lease terminations with Rochester Housing Authority. One was for being behind on her RG&E payments and another for being in arrears with the rent and her great granddaughter refusing to sign the payment plan. Um, every time we talked, she mentioned the evictions and she began crying. She said her great granddaughter that recently moved out of the house needed to sign a form that she was no longer living there um, to be taken off the lease, but she didn't know where she moved to. Um, her 17-year-old great-granddaughter is still living with her, but they have to move because they only require a two-bedroom now. Um, her daughter had been in contact with Rochester Housing Authority regarding the eviction and rent payments, and I faxed the, pa faxed the patient's rg &E budget billing plan to the property manager at Rochester Housing Authority, and that lease termination was dismissed. So one of them was taken care of. 
She also, um, when she was at the older adult clinic, she was using a cane and she was walking very unsteadily to her car. She was driving home that day. And so I asked Anne to send a prescription for a new walker. The wheels on her walker were broken, so she faxed a prescription to Fonte Medical Supply for a rollator walker with a seat. So now patient's Medicaid is active and she's using transportation again. Um, her daughter in Virginia called the housing specialist at Rochester Housing Authority and was told that she was not gonna be evicted and they're working out a new payment plan with her. Um, and they're also assisting her with locating a two bedroom apartment for her and her great granddaughter with accessible laundry facilities. And the new walker was delivered to dialysis. So the next things we're going to be working on, I'm going to be working on with her, are establishing aid service, which she has been agreeable to, at least for some transportation to shopping. I don't think she's going to let him touch her laundry yet um, or help with house cleaning, but we're slowly moving in there um, and beginning the adult day program, because I think it would be really nice for her on the day she's not at dialysis. One thing that was interesting about dialysis, she said that is a place where she feels really happy. She was very connected with the social worker there, and she just, she smiled when she talks about dialysis. It's a place that she really enjoyed going to. Um, so yeah, it truly takes a team. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I forgot to mention that um, we were able to start this program only because of the HEPSO, the uh, system transformation funds that uh, the university got um, with, with, as part of the DISRP funding, right? And so um, they funded this uh, with the goal of having this completely independently managed um, within the next uh, two to three years, right? Um, so because we had to hire everybody, right, with, before we had a clinic, because we just started um, seeing uh, her in October, she was the first patient. Uh, and, and I wanted to make sure we sat this way because this is, this is a team that we still work on everything together, right? Um, nothing ends. Just like a couple weeks ago, we really thought she, she could be evicted from her house. So we were mm -hmm. all like we, rallying, we have to do something now. Um, and I want to uh, also thank uh, Dr. Lee for his support. Memory care, if you don't know, is actually the place where he does uh, his clinical work. So he is well informed about uh, the patients and their needs here, and um, we couldn't be doing all this innovative work without him, his support. Uh, there is one question. Um, can I just read uh, the statement that was uh, Kim Van Orden sent a question in. Uh, at, Thanks for this presentation. Your case example of an older black woman whose function appeared higher than her MOCA score made me think about research that suggests that some items on the MOCA are biased and can misclassify older adults who are black and Hispanic, which suggests using lower cut scores for these subgroups. In addition to the extra point for educational attainment, do you have thoughts on these score adjustments? Seems like there are pros and cons. And I absolutely do think that a lot of the testing we do definitely has all kinds of bias, right? Um, uh, what were the samples that they were using? Right? What are the words that we choose? And that's why when people have scores on whatever it is, the MOCA, the slums, the MMSC, that's a only one data point. We are always telling people, right? The diagnosis of dementia is not from this number. It's about what it's like in your life. How are you functioning, right? Um, and you might have a very low score and I don't say you have dementia, right? It's, it, so, so they're all biased, yes. 100%. Uh, so if somebody out there can figure out another way to, to fix this, that would be fantastic. Uh, are there any questions here? Maybe none. Okay, I just wanted you guys to, you know, hear about what we're doing. We're really proud of this work. Hopefully you'll hear more about it. Um, and we welcome any, any other questions, you know, I'm on global, so. Great. Thanks. Thank you all for your wonderful presentation. And I think um, uh, your case presentation really exemplifies the values that we hold within our department. Um, and I think it's just, you know, the work that you do together, as you mentioned, the teamwork, but also really thinking about the patient and the patient's needs uh, beyond what we can do medically um, is really important and certainly um, we're 
hoping that this kind of work can continue um, in a number of the areas, service areas that um, uh, we have within our department. But I think it truly exemplifies exactly what we've been talking about in terms of really thinking about the, uh, the person holistically, family, community, um, and it's not just about their medical condition nor their psychopharm management, right? That was minimal here uh, in terms of helping her and her family to address her needs.